for, I have a, just a couple of disclaimers and then I'll jump into this thing. I have some, a number of slides that we can go through. Um, well, first of all, one thing is please feel free to ask a question or make a comment at any time. Okay? Um, I don't want to just stand here and blah, blah, blah. blah. If you've got something to say or, or whatever, please uh, say so. Um, my major disclaimer is uh, I do not pretend to represent all Vietnam veterans. American Vietnam veterans, right? I was one soldier who was over there at one particular time in one particular place, did my thing and stuff like that. So I don't speak, pretend to speak for all Vietnam veterans, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, although when we get together, oftentimes we share a, a lot of uh, commonalities, if you will. Um, the other thing is I, I made a big deal about uh, when I went back to Vietnam, I went back uh, end of July and early August of this year for 12 days. Um, and uh, I said I, was, I would never go back to Vietnam as a tourist. Uh, I just didn't want to do that. Um, so I was given this opportunity, as Doug referenced, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, but I have to say, quite frankly, I was a tourist <laughs> part of the time. I really was. Uh, it's a fascinating country right? it, in, man, in many, many ways. And I'll talk about the experience I had. Um, the other thing is I would like to say to all veterans in the audience, welcome home. Um, welcome. So yeah. Um, OK, I'm done. No. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, I know some of you might think this is Brad Pitt, but it's not. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> set, set moi. <laughs> 53 years ago. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> is that a compliment or is it? <laughs> oh, okay, all right, I know. God. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have something. <laughs> Just, no, I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, I got to say, you know, wh when this picture was taken was, um, quite frankly, uh, there was this guy who had this thing about taking pictures of people, FNGs, they called them, called us. Blank new guys. Okay. Uh, and this was right after my first mortar attack. Right. And so, he, you know, hey, boy, come on, what? And there it is. So uh, there I am, 53 years ago. So, um, but. I went to Vietnam as part of this conference. It was held in Hue by the Vietnamese people. There were about 500 people at the conference. They were almost all Vietnamese. Some people from Borneo, some people from uh, the Netherlands, a few of us from the United States, but mostly Vietnamese. Uh, and it was part of what they called Engaging with Vietnam. It's their 14th annual cultural heritage conference. It was six days, packed with all kinds of different workshops and whatnot. They asked us to come to this conference because um, one of my good friends, Ron Carver, put together this book, Waging Peace in Vietnam, the GI resistance movement uh, to the Vietnam War. And the Vietnamese people, almost all of them, people that I met, were totally unaware of the fact that there was a movement amongst us to stop the war as soon as we possibly could. Right? And what Ron did, he's put together this collection, it's all primary text, he's the editor of it, and then he had it translated into Vietnamese. And that was the moment, okay? So he's, he's working with a woman who's uh, director of the War Remnants Museum in Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon. Footnote, I talked to people, Vietnamese people, I said, is it Ho Chi Minh City or is it Saigon? They said, we don't care. <laughs> you guys are hung up about it. We're not hung up about it. Call it whatever you want to call it, right? So he works with the War Remnants Museum, the woman directing that, and we'll see her, pictures of her in a moment. Uh, and so they worked together to put this together in Vietnamese. And uh, this was like Ron's ninth or tenth visit to Vietnam, so he was quite familiar with the country. So he was our, our guide at first, and then other things happened, and I was I'll talk about. But this was the reason. And we did a, uh, a panel discussion about waging peace in Vietnam. Uh, and it was incredible to look out at the audience and all these Vietnamese college students, as well as professors and teachers and all that stuff, just really being totally absorbed by this whole notion, okay? Um, when, you, when you said they weren't aware, were they not aware of the whole peace movement or just the veterans? The vet, mostly the veterans. I think they were, yeah. they, you know, they heard the usual stuff they about all these flower children right, throwing right. flowers in the United States, blah, blah, blah. But for what, people who are actually in the military, right. you know, against war, what? Yeah. Which is, of course, when Veterans for Peace started, I have to say, uh, I was one of these guys who was adamant of calling the group Veterans Against Foreign Wars. And these other people said, no, 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 make it positive. Veterans for peace. And it was a brilliant suggestion. Because when people see veterans for peace, for example, they just, just stop for a minute. How can veterans be for peace? Well, we have to be, right? 
And by the way, I have to say, we were at this restaurant tonight, and I'm wearing this shirt. This is a Veterans for Peace logo there, like this. And a woman came over, the wait waitress, and she said, are you a veteran? Said, yeah. She said, it was a 25% discount. I said, oh, really? I, I, I see that you were in the Air Force, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I was in the Army. <laughs> she was young. <laughs> so, so, whatever. <laughs> So here it is, engaging with Vietnam, and I, will, and I have lots of slides, so we'll rip through them. Um, Set Moi standing there, it was, a, it's, it was held in a school. Uh, of course, it's, it's August, right? I mean, August in Vietnam, how many of you know that feeling of incredible heat, incredible humidity? We thought we'd be in air-conditioned places, we were not. This conference was held in this open-air school, big school with fans and stuff like that, plenty of water. I drank 12 bottles of water a day. I mean, we were just like, holy crap. But it was fine. And I said, OK. So they knew what they were doing. So um, we flew into Hanoi. Uh, we started in Boston, went to Atlanta, from Atlanta to Seoul, Korea, and then from Seoul, Korea to, to, to Hanoi. Only a 26-hour flight. So, are you kidding? <laughs> and Hanoi is. Uh, I'm sorry? Can you screen, see the screen better? Are you OK? It's your call. It's all right? It's okay. Good. Because I actually have handouts that I want to make reference to. Uh, so, you know, so landing in Hanoi, um, first of all, here's a map of Vietnam. Uh, and um, when I was there 53 years ago, that's where I was, in Bong San, in the Central Highlands, all right? Here's Hanoi, all right? So uh, landing in Hanoi was not like my experience down here at all. I mean, you're looking at a city of 10 million people, right? You know, and, and we get off, my son and I get off the plane and we go around and, and get out there and baggage and taxis and some young guy comes around and well, ride, ride, ride. And we said, oh, sure. So we jumped in this guy's car, you know, he's driving along and I go, uh, credit card? No, 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 cash, cash. This is at 1030 at night in Hanoi after being on a plane. Uh, ATM. <laughs> go to an ATM, all right? You know what the exchange rate is? A dong. Uh, you go to the ATM machine look at it, and you take out two million dong. And that's about what? 60 bucks? <laughs> Something like that. I'm, I'm standing there. I'm two million for my checking account? Two million? Okay. <laughs> but he was a nice guy. He, you, know, you could tell he was just doing this. You know, he's not really a cab driver. And that was the nature of a lot of the people we ran into were just really engaging, wonderful human beings, right? Um, and, and if you look at these pictures, I used to think of Vietnam as a third world country. I don't think so, not anymore. Electric buses, electric cars, all kinds of stuff, high rise apartments. We stayed at the authentic hotel in the old city. Of, uh, and these, not only were they wonderful, we came back after we, we were there for 12 days, we came back to Hanoi and flew out of Hanoi. But our flight was supposedly to leave at uh, eight in the morning, so we had to get to the airport at six, so we had to leave at five. And so I told these people that we got to get up five. So we come downstairs and they pack the breakfast for us. Oh. Oh. That's sweet. I mean, that's just the nature of who they were. They said, here, here, take, take, take breakfast. Uh, this is the famous oops, scan thing here. If I get rid of that, boom. Appar apparently a famous island. I guess the turtles are worshipped in Vietnam. I didn't know about that. But the, one of the myths is that there's some... Emperor had this big sword and all that kind of stuff. It was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And this huge turtle came up out of this lake and grabbed the sword and took it down. And so for, the legend is that the turtles come up and they worship these turtles. The, the country that side that I ran across was just loaded with all kinds of artwork and stuff. Uh-oh. Something's not happening here. Um, as we're getting, that, getting the assistance, uh, a few things I actually have paper props, right, uh, which, you know, when I, I taught a course in peace studies at the university, and I would begin it by handing out a three-ring binder to the students, and they go, what? I said, I hand out a lot of paper, all right? <laughs> and, the, and the exams and all that kind of stuff are going to be open book and stuff like that, so you have to have paper. So I'm used to handing, having a lot of handouts. So while I'm trying to fake the idea of I know what I'm doing with the technology, I'll talk about a few things that were handed out. One is I'm uh, one of the editors of this newspaper, P Peace and Planet News, uh, Veterans for Peace. There are some back there. They're free. Um, we put out, try to put out quarterly issues. Sometimes we put out six a year or whatever. And sometimes we do special issues. 
And this one is a, a special issue on the environment and the military, impact of the military on the environment. Um, and in it, uh, I've got a couple of articles, and one is um, a, an, an essay I wrote about going back to Vietnam with my son. Um, so these are free. Um, this particular thing, I, can, I don't know if you can see it, uh, I got this in a poster shop in Hanoi. Uh, and if you look at it, you've got a dove taking the letter A out of war ah, and putting it up into peace. It's on its way to putting it up into peace. Oh, yes. Okay. Stay. Hey, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? Yeah, really. One, be one slide away, right? So. Okay, so here are some shots, you know, again, of, of, uh, of being kind of a tourist. Hanoi, this bustling city. How, how many people have been to Hanoi? Yeah, okay, okay, right? The driving, the traffic, right? I mean, this is like, it's, it's, it's crazy. People coming in. I saw one accident the whole time I was over there, and I'm telling you, I thought I'd see 100. A lot of street cuisine. Uh, chowing down on stuff. I don't know what the guy's making there. <laughs> this is how we ate oftentimes. My son and I would go out in the morning, six o'clock in the morning or so, and roam around, and we'd end up in these places, or we'd go out at night, and we'd end up at these places like this. A lot of street food. We had a, a, eventually, we had drivers, uh, Vietnamese drivers. And I asked them, I said, um, do you have a problem with the homeless? No. No. I said, you know. People are living out on the streets, right? Yeah, no, they're living, you know, they're working, they're out there. No, we don't have a problem with homeless. So I don't know if he's telling me or not, but um, again, this is the kind of thing, if you wanted something from the rice paddies or whatever, there they were, selling the stuff. Uh, and just, yeah. And every hotel room we stayed in, you know, it, they'd come and deliver these fresh fruits and stuff like that, and, you know, in, in the afternoon. Pretty neat. There he is. This is the famous Egg Coffee Cafe, uh, 1946, right? And there's my son and I looking at the, uh, the menu. Uh, this is me giving a workshop on how to eat with chopsticks. Uh, <laughs> actually, I was so bad, virtually every restaurant I went to, eventually somebody would come over and give me a fork. <laughs> say, okay, man, <laughs> nice try. This is that poster store. So the, this poster here, was one of these small ones, um, like this, that we got in this poster store. Uh, and the woman had them separated by themes and various things like that. And most of them, this is my, the inkling I began to get. Uh, this is a war told from their side, not my side, okay? And if you look at some of the posters, a lot of them are, you know, Ho Chi Minh, a lot of, uh, this is how we shot down bombers, uh, this, that kind of stuff. Um, she's a wonderful person. There we are again. You see Ho Chi Minh there, the USA, thing, you know. Uh, they weren't in your face. Uh, they're beautiful posters. And they're in this, this sort of cloth kind of thing. This, by the way, I had blown up at the university, um, this very thing. But anyway, she was wonderful. Um, she knew who she was talking to, obviously. Um, but she had her stuff there, and a lot of it was... We're proud to be Vietnamese, and we're proud to have uh, fought back the Japanese, the Chinese, the French, the Americans, you name it. Uh, and we're still doing it. Um, so other place we ended up is a place called 54 Cultures. And they're very proud of the fact that there are a number of ethnicities in Vietnam, different, and they're differentiated significantly. Uh, and so this particular place, very expensive uh, place, showed a number of different replicas from different cultures around Vietnam, stuff like this. Like that. Like that. And then the street art, right? I mean, you're walking down the street. Oh, yeah, I, I, mean, I just literally, I walk it down, I look down, and here is this beautiful dragonfly on the street. You'd never been to Hanoi. I'd never been to Hanoi, yeah. Had you? You certainly had been to Saigon. And no. During the war? No, I flew, okay, well, okay, real quickly, all right. I was, uh, um, I graduated from college in 1968, uh, and I was going to go into the Peace Corps. I decided not to, so I quickly went to Ohio State University to get into graduate school to avoid the draft. And my draft board said, uh uh not graduate, undergraduate, 2S deferment doesn't count. You have to report, I'm from Rochester, New York, you have to report to Buffalo, New York on January 9th. 
1969 for induction in the United States, or you'll get fined $10,000 in five years in jail, whatever. I said, well, holy crow. Uh, so, so anyways, I was all screwed up, and uh, I eventually said, oh, screw it. I had three brothers, and they all went into the National Guard. They got out of it. My parents are from Canada, so I'm in Rochester. I could have jumped over. I had aunts and uncles and cousins in Canada. I could have done that. could have done all these things. I didn't. For whatever reason, if there's any psychologists in the room, they can tell me why I did what I did, right? So, no, that's okay. But but anyways, I want to get to I want to get to your point, you know. And, and that is okay. So then I was drafted out of graduate school, right? I mean, I literally got that letter at Ohio State. And I said, greetings. It says greetings. <laughs> Report to Buffalo. Oh my God. So then, all right. Then it was all right. Basic training at Fort Dix for eight weeks. AIT, Advanced Individual Training, in, in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and artillery for nine weeks. Okay, now, during the eight weeks, they're in basic, you know, they're just, basic training, and they were just interested in beating the crap out of you and making you follow instructions. But in AIT, they, they kept on saying, you guys aren't going to go to Vietnam. You're going to go to Korea, Hawaii, you know, Japan, you know, whatever. But you're not going to go to Vietnam, right? And I think they were telling us that to keep us there. So at the end of AIT, literally at the end of it, after the nine weeks, you stand in front of a desk, some guy's desk, and guys look, Rawlings. Okay, uh, Travis Air, Air Force Base on July 2nd, 1969, for deployment to Vietnam, Republic of Vietnam. I'm going, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, I'm this college punk. What do you, what? Two week leave. Again, I went back up to Rochester, New York, and got drunk, you know, and I could have gone to Canada. I didn't, right? And then it was Travis Air Force Base. Here's to your question. Fly, and then eventually uh, landed in. Uh, uh, Tonson Newt Air Force Base, uh, just outside of Saigon, was there for a couple days. And by the way, when, when I went over there, I didn't go over with a unit. I went by myself. I didn't know anybody. I got off that plane in Vietnam. I didn't know a soul, right? And just these guys yelling at me and doing blah, 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 kind of crap. And finally, you know, after a couple of days there, they call you out in formation and they say, okay, no, thanks, all right, okay, you're going to have to go to LZ Uplift uh, in Bong San. I said, what? Whatever. So, they put me on a chopper and a, you know, a truck, and boom, 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 and I end up in this place in the Central Highlands, uh, which is where I stayed for 13 months, 13 and a half months, 411 days, or as I like to say, 822 nights. Yes, the nights were the, the tough part. But I never was in a city the whole time I was there, ever, right? No. Uh, Went back out through the air, the air base? And yeah, right. Oh, yeah. They, when we left, when we left country, it was like, they, they they put us in cages. You get me? I can I can digress. Look, you're you're in a, they, they, I was I was strip searched because I looked like somebody who was doing a lot of dope. I was, uh, but, yeah, but you know. So okay, uh, and then and then they put in these cages, right? Literally, and you're waiting there, waiting there. A plane pulls in. You get on that plane. That plane comes around. You're out of there, right? And I'll tell you, the sound on that airplane when we break out of that air. Like, holy crow, I was like, yes, <laughs> holy crow. Coming in was an entirely different ball game, right? It was like dead silence. I was like, what the hell's going on, All right? So you got me digressing, but anyways, no, thank you. yeah. Yeah, yeah cause, and you didn't, did you, go to, you didn't go to Saigon on this trip either. No, I didn't. I didn't get down there. Yeah, um, yeah mainly because I wanted to, you know, I'll show you guys what we did. We drove around and all that kind of stuff. We basically hung around this area here at the DMZ. Uh, yeah. And the conference was in Hue, and then we did all these things around here. That's what I wanted to go there, right. okay? Um, because I have um, a collection of poems, uh, which is inter interspersed with uh, all kinds of photographs that my buddy took when we were in Vietnam. Mm. And so my dream was to go to Bong San in August, walk up to somebody in the village of Bong San and say, is that you? Is that you? All right. 53 years ago? I don't know. I didn't do it. I couldn't have a chance to do it. But um, that's what the game plan was. But uh, it was too far to travel, and we had other things that we ended up doing, unfortunately. OK, so I don't even know what this was. Just an interesting picture. Night scene, Hanoi. Get the idea. The park. Uh, you know, the, the artwork and out in the streets and stuff like that is absolutely stunning all over the place. You'll see a lot of sculptures and stuff like that. And they're open to the public. It's not like you have to pay money to see these things. These parks have just got these incredible sculptures. So that's me on the river. First handout in, your, in the packet that I gave you um, has a little bit of information about Hua Lao Lo Prison. Uh, not that we'll read it all, but uh, it's in Hanoi. Uh, and it's famous 
from the American perspective of being the Hotel Hanoi, right, where our POWs were, uh, you know, where McCain was and all, the, they, they were there, right, this prison. But what the Vietnamese focused on was what the French did to the Vietnamese. So this prison was built by the French right in the middle of, of Hanoi uh, to torture Vietnamese. Uh, and so what you see as you enter this museum, mostly are these, this perspective. Okay, this is the way they treated the Vietnamese. There's the guillotine, mobile guillotine, right? They would bring in, grab a guy, and the rest of the, rest of the guys, imagine. So that's what they focused on. Um, this is more, a little bit more from the focusing on the torture um, of the Vietnamese. Another shot from that. And then, then, then they have a section about the American prisoners. And the article I gave you, uh, you can look at a little bit later, points out how the Vietnamese showed how brutal the French were to the Vietnamese. But when you walked into the section dealing with how the Vietnamese treated the Americans, Americans are clean shaven, comfortable, wonderful, everything's fine, this is a good place to be. Uh -uh. <laughs> it's their, it's their tell, they're telling the story the way they want to tell it, right? Uh, so that's one section of it. Uh, and that's the, uh, what the prisoners wore. So that we uh, fly down, from, we fly from Hanoi to Hue, uh, which is the um, imperial city on the Perfume River. It was the place really where, uh, during Vietnam's many, many years without being colonized, where really the, French, the, the Vietnamese called that their, their capital. And there's some very famous battles that took place there. Um, but the conference was held there. Uh, and this, this is not a painting, this is not a drawing, this is literally a young man. <laughs> Welcome to our conference. And you can see me walking along back there. Welcome. This is, we got this over and over and over again. And then Ho Chi Minh attended the school where the conference was held, all right? As well as Diem did, the president of South, South Vietnam. It was a very famous school, okay? And he was kicked out uh, after a year. I read this a little bit later on. I didn't know that at the time, but... Uh, for raising hell, I guess. Um, so there it is. So you see that. Now, you know, I, don't, I like to tell people when, you know, uh, you see the flag there? You see Ho Chi Minh? I mean, when I was in Vietnam, in the Central Highlands, we were surrounded by the uh, NLF, the VC, the Viet Cong, National Liberation Front, whatever you want to call them. Not the NVA. We never did with, dealt with the North Vietnamese Army. And we were terrified. If we would have seen that flag, that red flag with a gold star, where we were, we were screwed. Okay, so to come down in this, in this country now, this is one of the things that, that, that got me a, a little bit unsettled, if you will, was to see this flag all over the place, all over the place. <laughs> I had to get used to it. This is the park across from the campus. This is a perfect example of all, everywhere we went, places like this, just beautiful stuff. My son, who traveled with me, he's 47 years old now. <laughs> He's, a, he's an international traveler, and he's a good photographer. So while I was in this conference in, in Hue, he was roaming the city, taking all kinds of pictures. And if you look at this statue, I mean, it's just, just let's see the background, see how big that thing is? And it's a picture of a Vietnamese girl, or a picture, rather, a sculpture of a Vietnamese girl. So there's myself and this, uh, and this guy, David, uh, who was in the Marines uh, in Da Nang, was injured. Uh, and moved back to, and lived as living in Da Nang now. He's been there for about 12 years. And he married a Vietnamese woman. And he, what he's doing is he's helping plant trees. Um, that's part of his job. Uh, he wants, he's trying to, to rebuild, if you will, uh, the, the environment positively. An interesting guy. Has his own motorcycle. I'd be glad to take you around. If you want to go to, if you want to, go to Da Nang, let me know. I'll hook you up with this guy. He's a little crazy, but he's a good guy. He's a good guy. So here's the conference, right? Um, Vietnamese people. There's the auditorium filling up. Uh, this is, again, really weird. Um, every, almost everything was in Vietnamese. And so they sat us, and see the two front rows there? Uh, we had earphones, and so we had Vietnamese translations, if you will. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it helped a lot, obviously. Uh, and it was an academic um, conference in many ways. Um, yeah, Robert De Niro shows up at different places. So. Uh, and that's, you know, you look at the stage there, that's indicative of the people who, 
who spoke and presented and stuff. Um, it was five or six days uh, and uh, workshops, 10 workshops at a time in different segments during the day, like four or five different segments during the day, plus you know, major speakers in this auditorium and stuff, talking about the heritage. You know, How can young Vietnamese women uh, overcome the Confucian code of uh, patriarchy that's ruled this country for centuries? That was one of the presentations. Uh, another presentation, I, I, I wandered into a, some of these conferences and sat down. They're in little classrooms, right? Uh, and, and the people are speaking Vietnamese and there's no translation. So I'm just sitting there going, whoa, okay, you know. Uh, you know. And inevitably somebody would come over to me and, and look at me and say, you don't really understand, do you? I said, no. And they would help translate. But one of the ones I went to, what's given by this guy from Brunei, oh, he's, gonna, he's coming up. Uh, yeah, let me jump ahead for a minute. Uh, and it was in, in, it was in English, okay. And there were four groups of people. And one of the groups presenting were these four Vietnamese college students. They were seniors. And their presentation, and they spoke perfect English, was on PTSD, right? You know, and you know, one of the things, that, you know, they don't have PTSD in Vietnam. We got it. They don't have it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they spoke beautifully about what was going on and all the re their research and what they're doing. Uh, and I have a poem written about PTSD, which I, when they were done talking, I snuck over and gave them the copy of the book. And then when I did our presentation, the next day, they were there, okay? Uh, and and uh, the one young woman came up to me and she said, uh, I'm, senior, okay, I'm doing a capstone project. Could I translate your poems into Vietnamese as my capstone project? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I would love that. Um, this is, there were, you know, I, I, I'm your typical white male. <laughs> right, who doesn't like to admit to it publicly about any kind of extreme shows of, of emotion, if you will. Um, but when this started, uh, so I'm sitting in this auditorium, right in the front row like this. Okay, these kids come out and they start doing this stuff. I, I, I broke down into sobbing tears. I had to leave the auditorium, go out into the hallway, and just I was consumed by this, I, where, did, where did that come from, right? My son came out and consoled me. It was, it was just like, I, didn't, you know, I don't like doing that crap, right? I swore I wasn't gonna do that, but it hit me, and I realized what happened was, when I was in Vietnam, the kids, I, I never saw kids like this. I never saw joyful, teenage kids, right? We saw older people, we saw little kids, we saw a few teenagers, but they were not joyful, and they were not having a great time. These kids were joyful, singing up on the stage, and I go, oh my God, this is what we did to those children. That's the thing that really sticks with me more than anything else. So I'm at this table sitting here, and this guy sidles up to me, and he, and he speaks a little English. So I'm sharing some pictures with him. And he tells me, he says, my uncle, VC, my uncle, VC, Viet Cong. I said, oh, really? Yeah. Well, the next day, he invites his uncle to this conference, OK? And he's saying, sure, OK, I'll get to him in a moment. So I had, I had my books, a book of poems, you know, and if I chatted it up with anybody and it looked like we were on the same page, I gave him a copy of my poems. Um, typical lunch <laughs> at, the, at the conference. Uh, and most of the meals, by the way, they just throw the food in the middle of the table and you just <laughs> grab whatever you want to grab. Okay, this is Ushi and David. Uh, Ushi is a Vietnamese woman he married. Um, she's wearing, uh, the, our, we have a chapter in Hanoi, of Veterans for Peace, longtime chapter of Veterans for Peace. In Hanoi. By the way, we have a sister chapter uh, in Russia, Komi Republic, and we're corresponding. Our chapter in Maine is a sister chapter with them, and we're corresponding back and with them a little bit. That correspondence has dropped off, obviously. We're hoping to rekindle it. But we have chapters around the world, and, and our Hanoi chapter is really one of our favorites. This is the guy, this is my friend Chuck, who I'll talk about moment, momentarily. He's, he's lived in Vietnam 35 years now. Uh, he was in the intelligence, he was in Saigon in the intelligence during the war. And he came back and he's done all this amazing stuff, which I'll talk about. This is the guy from Brunei that he was talking to. So we got to go to his conference. So I, um, the panel presentation we did uh, was in this room. And Ron Carver, the guy who helped organize all this stuff, is carrying this big picture. And we call it, I refer to it as the girl in the picture, right? Most people our age, if I say the girl in the picture, you know what I'm talking about. Young people really don't, okay? And a lot of Vietnamese didn't know this. So in your, in your packet there, um, you have my remarks. And I would like to just read these. It takes about maybe eight minutes. 
so this is, the, these are, this is how I spoke. Uh, this is my, my presentation as part of this panel. Everybody got one? Do you want to read it if you're not? Okay, the, the opening session and the concept of heritage not only moved me, but got me to rethinking the concept of heritage itself. I've concluded that we who are in the United States military as part of the American war in Vietnam are now part of Vietnam's heritage. And through us, American veterans, Vietnam has become part of America's heritage. Perhaps we're actually haunting each other because of this connection. Here's a poem by a Marine veteran of this war, Bill Earhart, that I think captures a part of this hypothesis, making the children behave. Do they think of me now in those strange Asian villages where nothing ever seemed quite human but myself and my few grim friends moving through them hunched in lines? When they tell stories to their children of the evil that awaits misbehavior, is it me they conjure? It's an honor to be here not only because of the amazing privilege that comes with witnessing the eternal blossoming art as artists, scholars, and activists combine forces, but quite frankly, it is doubly an honor because of my age. I'm a proud father and grandfather who has the privilege of speaking through the lens of seven and a half decades on this planet. And finally, it's a triple privilege, if you will, because I can now speak directly to those who have benefited from the courage of their grandparents. I'm speaking to the Vietnamese now. In 1969 and 1970, I looked directly into the eyes of elderly women and men who stared back at me defiantly, standing between armed soldiers and their beloved grandchildren. Over these years, I've come to realize that their courage brought me to the realization that my country's invasion of Bong San, village of Bong San, was morally corrupt and indefensible. Because of them, I became a resistor to war. During my time in the Central Highlands and increasingly I, as I return home to my own country. I'm proud to say that the resistance of tens of thousands of veterans and active soldiers in the United States military, combined with the valiant efforts of the Vietnamese people, brought this horrific war to a close. Let me now conclude my remarks with two poems that I have written from my grandfather's perspective. Let me stop here for a second. Ron Carver, who organized this thing, did this brilliantly. Okay, so what he did, he told us, he said, when we spoke in English, there were four of us, three of us who were English, Every four or five sentences stop. And then this young Vietnamese woman read what we just read in Vietnamese. Rather than us going all the way through it, and then she going all the way through it, right? We would just stop after four or five sentences. She would read it. And I thought, that's crazy. Then I looked at the, the audience, and it really worked. It really, really worked. So um, there are poems of remorse filled by, fueled by what has come to be called moral injury which can be loosely defined as a reaction after many years of self-reflection to experiences one has had, either as a participant or as an observer, to morally re reprehensible acts while doing nothing to stop them. Remorse is deeply ingrained, which brings me to knowledge yet another honor. I can do this right, yes. Um, Ms. Or, or Dr. Tran Duan Tao, the director of the War Remnants Museum, has agreed to read each poem in Vietnamese. And here's the good news, my poems are very short, they are. So my first poem is entitled Unexploded Ordnance, written from my viewpoint as a former member of the United States 715th Artillery who haunted the Central Highlands around the village of Bong San for 13 and a half months. It's dedicated to Chuck Searcy and the many Vietnamese people who have worked with him through Project Renew, which we'll talk about in a moment. It is, yes, yet another honor to share the stage with him. So here's the poem, Unexploded Ordnance. So I was maybe all at 21 when they whipped me into some kind of soulless shape. Yet another one of America's weeping mother's sons sent forth into this world to raise, pillage, and rape. And now it's coming on to another Christmas Eve and songs of joy and peace fill up our little town. How, I ask myself, could I possibly believe I could do what I did and not reap what I had sown? In that land far away from what I call home, a grandfather leads his granddaughter by the hand into a field where we did what had to be done. They trip to a searing heat brighter than a thousand suns. And then I had Dr. Tao read, the, the, uh, read that poem. But what we're, Project Renew basically deals with identifying and removing unexploded ordnance from Vietnam, which is still maiming, after 50 years, it's still maiming and killing people in the, in the rice paddies, okay? And that's what Chuck Searcy's group does. We'll talk about Project Renew. So th this is in reference to that, my imagining you know, as a grandfather, walking with my little granddaughter through this rice paddy, and all of a sudden, damn, which is a reality. Anybody read Vietnamese? No? Yeah. No? Okay. 
So then, okay, so thank you, Chef Tushi Reddit. I'll conclude with a second uh, poem entitled The Girl in the Picture. It is inspired by this iconic picture from the American War in Vietnam that you see before you this afternoon. This picture won a Pulitzer Prize, and many acknowledge its significance in bringing the horror of war into the American people's consciousness. It, too, radicalized many American soldiers and veterans, compelling them to further resist the war. As far as the writing of the poem goes, it began as a suicide poem. Note, I tell my loved ones that not all poetry is entirely autobiographical. I was imagining committing suicide through the use of my truck. And by the way, that's part of the lore of the Vietnam veteran generation. It's what we used to call single car suicides, right? Find a Vietnam veteran dead on the side of the road, ran into a tree by himself. We called it suicide. The VA would not recognize it. We call it suicide. Um, so I was imagining committing suicide through the use of my truck, driving at an insane speed down a local road, the Ridge Road, and then turning the steering wheel sharply to the left into a tree. But then while crafting the poem, I read an article about Fan Thi Kim Phuc, the girl in the picture, and discovered that she was nine years old when that picture was taken that horrible day. My oldest granddaughter at the time of writing the poem was nine years old. Wham! The whole poem shifted into this poem of remorse that I will read to you now. It begins with a Buddhist aphorism, whatever you run from becomes your shadow. The girl in the picture for Fan Thi Kim Phuc, whatever you run from becomes your shadow. If you're a non-vet, survivor of sorts, She'll come for you across the decades, casting a shadow in the dying light of your dreams, naked and nine, terror in her eyes. Of course you'll have to ignore her if you wish to survive over the years, but then your daughters will turn nine, and then your granddaughters nine, as the shadows lengthen. So you'll have no choice on that one night screaming down a ridge road, lights off under a full moon. She's standing in the middle of the road, still naked and nine, terror in her eyes. Now you must stop to pick her up, to carry her back home to where she came from, to that gentle village where the forgiving and the forgiven gather at high noon. There are no shadows. And then she read it in, in Vietnamese. Um, and, you know, this was, like I said, a poem of remorse. And it was one of the things I hoped would happen on my journey back to Vietnam. And, and I, I say this over and over again, I really mean it. I have no right to ask the Vietnamese people to forgive me for what we did. Okay. But if forgiveness is offered to us, we accept it. Uh, and Dr. Tran said to us, we had, she was a wonderful person to be around. She looked at us and she said, you know, um, we don't forget, but we forgive. Okay. Um, so she read the poem. Thank you, Tao. You listening to me? Okay. So now, and then I put this sort of side note in, and actually it didn't happen, but I'll do it anyways. I said, okay, if there's a huge uproar in the audience, demands another poem. I'll read this one. <laughs> another perspective from the grandfather. It's entitled Grandfathers. In some of our homes, we have our children stand with their backs to a kitchen post. Okay? We then mark their heights with chalk on the post and date these marks. A fun way to keep records. But then the war creeps back into my consciousness. Here's the poem, Grandfathers. I watch my granddaughters grow up their heights me measured by chalking the kitchen post. So I think I know something about feet and inches as I watch grainy footage from the war of a Vietnamese grandfather, forearms of sinewy flesh, swinging his hammer with the authority of long experience, being interviewed by some American journalist. Staring into the hole of the camera through these five dec decades, I feel the agony of grandfathers so far removed from now, fashioning together coffin after coffin, each three feet long. And there is, that, there is that film. I've watched that film. And that's what you see stacked up behind this guy, are these small little coffins. So what, what is also in your packet there is a picture of Kim at a conference in Toronto, Canada, about 10 years ago, holding up the girl in the picture. That's her. After all these years, she's an inspirational speaker. She's married. She has children herself. But if you look at it, you know, what gets me about that, just, just her, the look on her face, it looks like, I really don't want to be doing this, but I'm doing it. I'm doing it. So that was the, uh, our present, our conference, whoops, 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 there we go, yeah. There are some of the people who are at the presentation. Um, okay, the guy in the front, uh, standing next to David, see David, they say who's she and David, and the guy right to David's left in the, in the pale blue shirt. 
that's the VC. That's the guy who was a VC. And, and when our presentation was over, he, you know, he spoke, when it was over with, he started speaking in Vietnamese, you know, from the audience. And I was wondering to myself, what is he saying? What's he saying? He thanked us for being there. And then we hugged. Formal banquet, as all these things have, you know. So. He also used NLF. Yeah. Is that the same? Yeah, it's a National Liberation Front. VC is a derogatory term, actually. It's a it, it, VC. Right. Viet Cong is derogatory, right? Okay. That, yeah, wait, I mean, we all said VC. They refer to them as National Liberation Front. <laughs> yeah. um, so I try, to, you know, try to be conscious of that. You know, trust me, when, you, when I was over there, I was consciously being careful about my language as much as I possibly could. I'm sure I offended some people. But. Uh, so the banquet... I love telling people, this was a formal banquet and there were beautiful dancers and stuff like that and the music was so loud, we had to leave. It was so loud and not just for us older duffers, but it was just poundingly loud. We couldn't, you couldn't have a conversation. So anyways, it was wonderful. This is Dr. Chan again. Um, she was just a wonderful person to be around. So this is Ron Carver's presentation, the guy who did the book, who edited the book. So this is a formal ribbon cutting ceremony, a waging peace installation at the conference, which is next to where the conference was. He actually rented this place, and, and Dr. Trowell, I keep on mispronouncing your name, I hope, brought stuff up from the War Revenue Museum and put it in this uh, place to show people uh, as they walked around. So there's myself and Ron and uh, Chuck Searcy. And you see the picture in the front there. And inside this exhibit now, this is what the mostly it was about United States soldiers and veterans who opposed America's war in Vietnam. And so there were a series of these. Ron was not a veteran himself, but he was a, he's a, been a, a, an activist, a labor activist for years. He was in the civil rights movement when he was an 18-year-old kid, and he's been an activist all of his life. Uh, but he got involved with the GI coffeehouse movement and then the underground newspapers, which were prevalent in American bases during the Vietnam War. Um, so we'll see some of those pictures of that. One was entitled Above Ground. You know, there, there are tons of these around. Um, and of course, you, if you got caught distributing these, these papers on, uh, you know, in some kind of military base or something like that, you were screwed, right? So um, this is Chuck. Uh, part of the, the, the presentation is about him, recognizing him in compassion and vision. We'll talk about Chuck in a moment. Rap for those who would today ask why but can't. In other words, they're dead. GI, GI resistance to the war. This is more of the, the kind of the pictures. LBJ was a long bin jail. You did not want to be sent there. Uh, I, was, I was given an Article 15. Where are the military people in here? Article 15. Yeah, reduction in pay, all that kind of stuff. I was in this little fire base. Uh, we had a couple of them. Uh, we had four howitzers, eight inches, 175s, because, and we were supporting 173rd. Well, there were a hundred of us on these little fire base, maybe even fewer, but they would send in these officers every once in a while, these majors, in order for them to get combat pay, to get whatever, do the kind of stuff. And they'd come in, and they, some of them were pretty nice guys, most of them were idiots, uh, and they would do stuff like, this one major showed up, I was in country maybe eight or nine months, and he showed up and he said, all right, I know you guys are buying dope from the, from the, from the uh, people living in the village, because the people in the village would come up to our wire. Constantino wire, right? Uh, and talk to us. Yeah, they were. Okay. So he says, I don't want you guys to not go into the wire anymore. Ah. So, hey, I'm a college punk, right? I said, screw you. So I went up to the wire, started talking to this Vietnamese, and he comes over, they come in, and they grab me and take me away, and they give me this Article 15, which is a reduction in pay, and it could end up in the LBJ, who knows? Uh, but he didn't know who he was dealing with. Um, I could write a little bit. I could think things. Most of the people I was with were like 18 and 19 year old kids, right? Uh, I, you know, I was 22. I was a college graduate. So I hopped on a chopper and, and flew to uh, 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 Phuket Air Force Base where they had an adjutant general's office in Egypt, which is like the lawyers. And I went into there and I presented my case against this Article 15. And my case was this. I wrote it all out. I said, look, you gave us a card that says our job is to win hearts and minds. That's what we're supposed to do, win hearts and minds. So how can I win hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people if I'm not allowed to communicate with them? The AG's office said, you're right. No Article 15. All right, I won. Not really. Because <laughs> when I got back to the, 
whoa, <laughs> I burned shit, excuse the language, right? I mean, you know, that's what we did with our, you know, one of the stories about Vietnam, right? What, how, what'd you do with your fecal matter, right? Well, we used half gallon, we took, you know, 55 gallon germs, cut them in half, put diesel fuel in there, and then pull them out and burn them. You know? You know what that smells like? No, I hope you don't. I hope you don't. That's how he's, this major, all right, Rawlings, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. You're going to be driving a deuce and a half, you're going to do this, that, and everything else. Uh, they were punks. <laughs> I, when I went to college, by the way, uh, I, you know, uh, in, I started in 64, uh, I went in, in Ohio. All of us had to, it was an all-male uh, Jesuit university. All of us had to take ROTC, two years of it, all of us. And then other guys who stayed in it, they, then they became officers and whatnot. So I knew kind of this officer training these guys were going through. And I, you know, I could look at these guys. Some of them even were younger than I was. And I said, oh, man, shut up. So this is more of Ron's work. Notice Jane Fonda there? Up the up West County, yeah, there she is. Uh, more of the papers that he was dealing with. Okay, now, as I'm at this conference, we may alluded to before, my son is now roaming the city of Hue, taking all of these amazing pictures. So we'll run through some of these. It's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, this, this, this is not unusual for these temple structures and all the stuff to be around. The Citadel... Very famous. It was part, of, I think it was built, I'm going to say in the 19th century, maybe earlier than that, but probably earlier than that, uh, which were, it was a traditional place. The palaces were the ruling lords, if you will, of Vietnam before the French showed up. Uh, that's where they all lived. And it was this huge complex, which has been mostly destroyed by war. Uh, but there's some of it is left over. Um, so he's roaming around, taking pictures of the citadel. I love that because I've got an incense burner that looks just like that. Mm -hmm. All those little incense burners. And then another example, park sculpture. Just I don't even know where this park was. Josh took it somewhere, but just this amazing stuff. <laughs> just Okay, now um, we enter the Renew project. And so the next, next thing in your uh, little folder there deals with Project Renew. Um, this. Uh, so I'm at this conference. It's a wonderful conference. I'm doing my thing. Chuck Searcy shows up. And Chuck runs, used to run Project Renew, okay, which was a, a, a started by American veterans uh, and then some French veterans and stuff like that. Um, figure out that they had to somehow go into these um, uh, villages and find these cluster bombs, if you will, mostly which we're talking about dropping in Ukraine right now, okay? These things are still out there, right? And, when, and, and, and Chuck said the worst part was right in 75 and 76 when the war was essentially over for them, scrap metal was incredibly profitable. And so people would go out into the rice paddies to find scrap metal, Pew, all right? The numbers of people who have lost limbs are staggering and lives, okay? So his project, Project Renew, um, is to deal with um, that kind of stuff. And they're in Dong Ha. Here are supporters. Uh, Irish help a lot. Uh, Norwegian help a lot. United States aid has started okay. It went and disappeared. Now it's back. Uh, our, we're, we're beginning to give more money to this project. Um, there's myself and Chuck with the staff. Project Renew. You walk into the education center. It's an amazing center. You look at this stuff there. Okay. Oh, just, that's just... We used three times the amount of munitions in all of World War II in that country. Where? See those red? That's where the bombs fell. That's what we did over and over and over and over again. So his project is basically they have an education, survivor assistance, and then at risk education. Help people, and they have prosthetics. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and help them remove the actual uh, munitions from the fields and then educate the young people about, okay, don't do this, don't do that. If you see this, let us know, that kind of stuff. So when you walk into the education center, this is what you see in the central display. Uh, it's really quite staggering. So we're uh, meeting with the Renew staff, um, talking about strategies to help them uh, finance what they're doing and, and get word out. 
Uh, amazing, those, these four Vietnamese guys sitting there like that, they're, they're talking about their grandfathers being on, on, on the opposite sides during the war and laughing about that. Um, 126 at this mo point, uh, staff members are out there in the field, either looking for munitions or being called into these villages. And there are some of them right there. That's the field crew. There they are, getting ready to go out into the field. This is separate from mines, because there's a big movement. Yeah. Mines out. They, I don't know about Vietnam so much. But. Excuse me. They do, they do a little bit with mines, but their major focus on cluster munitions. And okay. Unexploded munitions. Yeah, unexploded ordnance, right. Exactly, right. Yeah, and the stuff that most people, and, and what they say, what Chuck was saying is this stuff just, 50 years later, it's, it's, it's emerging you know, from the ground. I mean, what the heck? You would think they'd be done, they're done with it. He said it's a lot better now. They're trying to expand it. They've been mostly were in what they call the Quang Tri province, which was the most heavily bombed uh, area in Vietnam. That's where they were working. So this, they have these displays in the Ed Center. Uh, here's a, di a diagram of, of, of them, you know, the process of finding uh, an unexploded ordnance and removing it. Um, and there they are, finding them. There they are. There are more of them. And the prosthetics, right? That's part of what they do. And, and, and they took me for a tour, and I went into the, what they call the prosthetic lab. It just looked like one of our little wood shops. There was a guy, he had a, guy, he had a drill, he had a circular saw, and he had another uh, band saw. And that was it. And he's making, this one guy, all right? He's making these things like that. He showed us, here, take this, look at this one, hey, hold this. And, you know, and we know, now know what prosthetics look like, right? What they can be. These are, these are the old time, this is the old wooden leg you're going to put on a guy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this was in the corner of the, of the lab, you know. Just. So I gave a couple of my books to the uh, education center guy for their library. It was my son and the director, uh, uh, Renew, very interesting guy. There's a leader of Vietnam after Ho Chi Minh's death, not the guy in the white shirt, the statue. That's a, but Chuck to told me that he was stricter than Ho Chi Minh, <laughs> he was a, so anyway, so, we, so Chuck takes us out of this conference in the city of Wei and he said, come with me to Dong Ha, in the Quang Tri province, so we fly down there and get a driver and here we go. Now this, this was to me sort of the second stage of the trip, I wasn't expecting to do this and I'm really glad I did it because I got to the, into the countryside and this driver was just an amazing guy. So, you know, you drive along, you see these monuments, you stop, you look at things. You notice something strange about the tread? And then <laughs> we literally came around, and, hey, this is really neat. And, oh, God, there's a guy sleeping right there. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> there's a famous DMZ. The, the driver stopped the, the car and said, get out. Start walking up across that bridge. Right there. Line right there. That's North Vietnam, South Vietnam. You cross that line, you're now in North Vietnam. We're on the DMZ. Whoops. So we went to Khe Sanh, which is a little northern South Vietnam, a little under the DMZ, and we went through this. Boom. They lived in these tunnels. And the guy who took us for this tour, a Vietnamese guy, he said, you know, he spoke little English. We stay here many, many, many months. You up there, bomb us. We stay here. And if you see the light at the end of the tunnel there, literally, yeah. it opens up to that, oh. South China Sea. And again, he said, you know, your boat's out there. We in here. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hemingway joined us for a moment. So, <laughs> so we're driving along. You know, you know, this is not the Vietnam I remember. I mean, roads like this. I mean, you know, paved highways. with little, And here are the water buffalo. It's on their way to Da Nang. This is, this is the Vietnam I remember. This is what it was like for us in the Central Highlands, it was that, not the city, it was that. I like to say this is an ambassador, so we're driving down this road, it's like a you know, highway, uh, and all of a sudden all the traffic is stopped, and what's going on? We look further ahead, and boulders had come down and were blocking the road, and so they had some bulldozers moving. He says, all this traffic, so we're way back there. This is Chuck, right? All of a sudden this guy in a uniform comes over to our car and goes, he gets in his car and he leads us right to the front of the line because we're with Chuck, oh. the ambassador. Okay. Does he not look like an ambassador? <laughs> so, in, in, in many ways he is. Uh, 
So that Josh and me on the road there. Check. Uh, I like to say nature bats last. That's from some, I forget who, Emerson, something like that. Not Emerson, somebody who knows something about baseball. But after all the damage we did to that countryside, here it comes, back again, right? Lush, beautiful. Still on the road. Entering a town, I don't know the town, but I was struck by the thing over the top of the road there coming in, those white doves there and the communist flag. Huh. Oh, hmm. maybe they want peace too, right? Hmm. Another park sculpture. Beautiful. Then we go to Quezon. So I've got a handout in your, in your thing there about Quezon as well. Um, Quezon is famous from the American perspective uh, as during the Tet Offensive, the major Tet Offensive in 1968. Okay. So the Quezon battle was, you know, it was the most famous. It was a siege that was held for 77 days, and it was a Marine uh, encampment, and it was surrounded by North Vietnamese Army with artillery and all kind of stuff, uh, most of the stuff that we never saw, that, that kind of thing. And they held these people there for 77 days, right? Uh, and if you read, this, the thing I gave you is written by a guy who was there. So he said there's two different ways of looking at that. All right? It's either a, a major victory for the United States or a major defeat. Your call. Okay? And what, one of the reference points that he uses is the idea of the body count. Okay, so if we killed 7,000 of them, but they only killed 2,000 of us. We win, right? You know? And when you think about the Vietnam War, that's what got, got, got me when I thought about this. Most war, previous World War I, World War II, was talking about in real estate, right? You take this, you win this town, city, you take the next one, you know, and Vietnam was a guerrilla war. You didn't have, so they had to figure out a way to define victory, the body count, okay? And I was in an artillery unit, right? And we were just sending out these all the time, right? And who knows who, who they got, whether they got, we got reports back, and they were considered to be points for us, right? Killed 10, you know, 10, this thing here. Well, you got 25 over there, it didn't matter if they were soldiers or not, body count. So Quezon was a big, was a big deal. From, told from the perspective of the United States, it seemed like the Marines stayed, and, and they were brave. I mean, I, I, my neighbor was killed there, and, and they, they were brave young men uh, to do that kind of stuff. But was it a victory or not? This guy says, not necessarily. The, now the Vietnamese, is Quezon Cemetery, by the way, the person told me this, said each one of these gravestones, apparently what they do is after a person is dead for a, a year, they dig up the body and they take the, the bones and they re, reshape them and they put them in these little things here. So here they all are. This is the, around the caisson. This is from the Vietnamese perspective. It's my son at the cemetery there. Beautiful altars all over the place, you know. And then... Okay, you guys left. <laughs> this is what we got. This is in their museum. Okay, now they're not rubbing it in your face, right? But the message is pretty clear. We kicked your ass. <laughs> Here, look, see what you guys left behind? Huh? See that? Hey, left some cigarette packs, left identification. There's some of the weapons you left behind. Oh yeah, the old claymore. I remember those things. And this case on bunker. I, I took pictures of this and I pointed this out, Josh. This is how I lived. <laughs> this is what we lived in. A little bit bigger than that, but not much. And that's what it's like looking from the inside. And rats, hello, <laughs> mosquitoes. And again, another memorial. More at Quezon. Then they have the education center at Quezon. They like to have these pictures. Uh, a diorama of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. One of the stories they told us, they said, you know, um, you used to bomb our bridges. So you know what we did? We built our bridges eight inches or so beneath the surface of the water. They were still bridges, but you couldn't see them from the air. Huh? You know? I mean, this is the kind of stories you get from them. You go, see, we're not stupid. You know? I mean, we were, we were told the basic training, like, oh, these, God, they're savages. They're ignorant. They're so stupid. They're, God, blah, blah. You know, they're less than human. Uh-huh. OK. And here they are, Ho Chi Minh Trail, moving all kinds of equipment. Again, they love the perspective of different uh, ethnicities. I'd never heard this term before, blaze summer. They refer to that, I think, 72 is blaze summer. Uh, big bell at Quezon Cemetery. Leaving the memorial. Ah, this was a wonderful moment. I, we, I bought coffee and, and pepper. 
peppercorns from this woman because they have a commune there and they grow all this kind of stuff. And it's, you know, she was just delightful. It was after seeing all this stuff to encounter her was was wonderful. So then we go to the Friendship Village, which is the, the, the next thing in your packet there, um, which was started by uh, George Mizo, a member of Veterans for Peace, and it was dealing with basically Agent Orange, uh, survivors of Agent Orange. It's outside of Hanoi. Um, it's been around for a while, uh, and um, they deal with even children, grandchildren, Agent Orange. They have all kinds of cl health clinics, education centers, art things. This is my son with a young woman from, it's really a fascinating place. So then we go into Hanoi, I'm with Chuck now, and we go to this Hotel Metropole, which is where uh, uh, Clinton stayed, Obama stayed, Biden stayed, anybody, big deal, stays at the Metropole, okay? And of course we go by and it's being something, being reconstruction and they won't let you in. So as we're walking by, someone pokes their head out the door, Mr. Chuck, Mr. Chuck, come, 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 come. And so they took us inside, right, for a tour because of Chuck. This guy, Chuck Searcy, who's lived there for 35 years, Project Renew, Friendship Village, he's doing all this amazing stuff. Everybody knows this guy, everybody. So we go into the Metropole, which is a fancy, you know, 10-star hotel, elegant, chandeliers and all that stuff, and they take us into the, into the, ca uh, not the cafeteria, into the dining hall, and there's this shelter, bomb shelter, that they discovered. <coughs> and they said, again, what that says there, okay, well, one of the guests was Jane Fonda, another guest was Joan Baez. They have these pictures inside. And that, remember, forgive forever. And there it is. So you can eat this elegant meal in this beautiful place, and you walk by and you look down, and that's what you see. So this is taken from, and, you know, you go just driving along, and all of a sudden you see these amazing things. Lest we forget, <laughs> there are the flags. Beauty abounds. Okay, now, really quickly, a few more pictures of pictures that I took with a little insta so it's, the quality is obviously not as good. <laughs> this is the bridge into Bong San. We were terrified of this bridge. We drove this across this thing in deuce and a half all the time. You got across this thing as quickly as you possibly could. Going into the village. We we're driving a deuce and a half. grandfather, I took that picture from him. He's just looking at us like, you, I, I hate you. <laughs> Boy on a water buffalo. Path into the village. What we did, five or six of us, five or six of us, five, um, about eight, nine or month, ten months in country. We're in bonks on this. Everything is off limits. Everything is off limits. We said, to hell with this. So we would take off our flak jackets, our helmets, stack our weapons. One guy would watch them, and the rest of us would go into the village. We walked in the village unarmed to engage with the Vietnamese people. <coughs> Some people said, you're crazy? Maybe. But we never had, never had a problem. We did it maybe three or four times. <coughs> Into the village. It's me standing on one of their hooches. That's how they got water. Another village scene. Bong San Street scene, view from a guard bunker. It's us getting off guard duty. This is how we lived. I pulled a lot of guard when I was there. Set moi again. It's like, what? Huh? Me and a warm beer. Hotel Two Bits, we built this. We call this place Two Bits, was the name of this fire base. We were on good name. And we built this thing, complex for ourselves to stay in. We could. Every once in a while, we get these young women coming up from the village. Notice the choppers in the background. Uh, there was a dump. We would take all of our stuff, and these kids just lived in this dump. They lived off of our stuff. Village dope dealer. I'm not kidding. She was maybe, well, how old would you say she is? We call her Little Butterfly. She's the one who sold us our, our marijuana, uh, heroin, uh, and prostitutes. Okay, and imagine that's your daughter. There's the enemy, just looking at us through that concertina wire.
Let me just re read a poem for you, and then I'm, I'm done. It's the last thing on, in your packet there. I wrote this poem for my son uh, after we came back from this visit. Vietnam Redux or Redo. So I look twice now where I used to look only once, like where Routes 2 and 4 merge with Route 156. Or when my imagination takes me to a little village just on the other side of the River Styx, where there truly was hell to pay. There was many years ago, across that river and up and down those swirling tides where Beelzebub got to play with his gift box of G.I. Joe's as we desperately hung on for his satanic little ride. I went back to that land of my 50-year-old dreams, thinking I'd finally put some nightmares out the pasture, hoping to quiet down those mama san beetle mouth screams, looking for that proverbial sense of closure. But who am I to expect more from this madly tortured land that once swallowed up my illusions of masculine grandeur and spat out a soldier boy who had tried to become a man, only to become a tool of that mindless, endless slaughter? So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.